Alright, hello everybody. I'd like to welcome you to What a Wednesday tonight. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, and the, and the, I'd like the event of an emergency. Just, um, pretty much listen to us and just follow us out to the um, arts car park. Um, so tonight we've got Tim, who is our current architect in residence here at the university. And Tim um, also has, is a practicing architect in the city. So he'll be talking to us about what if housing was more affordable tonight. So enjoy. Thank you, Harrison. And I just want to add to what Harrison said and acknowledge the Warren Architects Education Trust who support or partially support my role as architect and president of the University of Canterbury. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be able to do some of the initiatives that I have been doing over the past year that I've been here. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't be uh, facing these challenges like talking to you, all of you here tonight. Um, I don't want to disappoint you, but the, the talk. My talk isn't exactly about buying a, an affordable house. <clears throat> it is about affordable housing, but in a broader sense than a monopoly house on a stack of coins symbolizes. The buying of a house is only one aspect of what housing is, of the meaning of house. Only one aspect of affordability, and it unfortunately reinforces the view that a house is first and foremost a commodity a view that would be beneficial to not always have the focus. So, what if housing was more affordable? What if a range of housing solutions were more readily supported by governments, banks, social institutions? What if architects and engineers could contribute creatively to the supply of housing and at the same time improve the environment? There are many what ifs. And here are a few more. <laughs> the affordability of housing has featured news headlines consistently throughout the year. But despite the high media profile, few satisfactory answers have been offered and the dream of owning a home has for many New Zealanders been pushed further and further out of reach. When asked to give this what if presentation at the beginning of the year, I thought media interest may have died away. Auckland's real estate market would somehow have been reined in. Housing initiatives would have been enacted in Christchurch. And this talk would therefore have gained a little bit of objective distance and a post-crisis set of circumstances with which to interpret recent views. But despite an indication just a few days ago that Auckland's prices had dipped or plateaued, we are still in the thick of not just trying to solve the crisis, but to frame it and understand the broad context, the connections, and the ramifications of New Zealand's <coughs> less than adequate housing performance on our society. It's not only the affordable housing crisis and news headlines week after week, Poverty, child poverty, domestic violence, violence against women and children, violent crime, violence in prisons and schools, underfunding of government and other social services, dysfunction within stressed service providers, including health, child youth and family, corrections. These issues are commonplace. These issues are, of course, interrelated. How can they not be? They shape and are shaped by shifts in population demographics and affect the way we live in society. And they have a relationship to the issues of quality and affordability in housing. A great many of these issues impact on New Zealand's standard of living and will continue to impact until more adequate solutions are put in place. Our situation is very similar to what has been happening around the globe. As welfare and politics and social politics become more polarised and as governments pass responsibilities over to private providers with profit-driven market-led solutions, it is no wonder the housing crisis has been deepening. If the definition of affordable housing is property priced at or below what is affordable for the median income earner to finance and still have sufficient left to live on, then consistently more and more families are finding housing unaffordable, even on a double income. It is recommended that no more than a third of the household income be used to repay mortgages, although banks can and do lend to a much higher threshold, 
essentially removing more money from circulation within the community. As we have seen in Auckland, the middle classes are now being priced out of the market along with low-income families, traditionally disadvantaged groups and alternatives and creatives. In response to this, some people choose to move into the regions where cheaper developments, <coughs> where property is still relatively inexpensive, though many regions are well above median rates, and others move to cheaper developments on the city, out, city outskirts and a two-hour car commute. If this depopulation becomes significant, as well as impacting the environment, it imperils the diversity that enriches cities and makes them interesting places to live. It risks the urban centre becoming a sterile world for business and themed entertainment, and it reduces the variety of social interactions. It smooths out the city grid. There will always be stratification of wealth, but surely it is better people interact in cities and so improve mutual tolerance. And I thought this slide was, was interesting in terms of um, uh, the city grid, uh, or the grid of our suburbs. Uh, the images on the left uh, are new developments uh, in New Zealand, uh, one in Christchurch at the bottom, one in Auckland at the top, uh, and on the uh, right, uh, an older, uh, slightly more traditional um, suburb development where you get a much greater variety of building types and housing types including multi-units uh, multi and, um, and rest homes and so forth. And you can see that in the, the variety of building shapes that are on the aerial photograph on the right. <coughs> the affordability of housing does affect us all, either directly or indirectly. At a simplistic level, it can affect us negatively, and for many it obviously does, for the majority of New Zealanders living within the middle to lower socioeconomic group, or positively for the few in positions of choice, power or privilege. We've been told the answer is to build more. How can we build more but better? How can we fund affordable housing and provide homes and rentals for people with below median incomes? How can the market provide bottom of the market products that are not bottom of the market quality? Can levies on upper level developments fund the affordable? Can allocation requirements on developments be raised to include more affordable units? Can tax credits encourage corporate and patron donations? or can higher taxes on property sales and capital gains taxes fund housing. Combine this with smarter, cost-effective design and more efficient and environmentally friendly <coughs> building methods, and we might start getting somewhere. Uh, this is a development in um, North Auckland called Hobsonville. Uh, uh, it's not an affordable housing development, although when it was first uh, put forward, there was supposed to be a certain number of affordable units uh, in the mix. Um, uh, there are a variety of price points within the development and um, much of the development has been designed uh, architecturally uh, but after work had started on site uh, the affordable units were removed from the mix. Was that a condition of the consent? Had that? I am not aware of whether it was or not but we can discuss that at the end of the lecture if you like. Yeah, I'm not sure. American architect Julie Eisenberg, <coughs> who was in New Zealand recently judging our National Architecture Awards, and who with her husband Hank Koning has designed something like 30 affordable housing developments in LA, says that what's cool about designing on a low budget is that it takes disciplined editing. You get smarter about how you design. But it is the design that creates a sense of dignity and ownership. If a resident doesn't feel as if they belong, they won't take care of the building. These are some examples uh, of her architecture. Uh, three different housing developments uh, in LA, uh, all including uh, low-income uh, housing um, options. As an architect, my focus is on the built environment. But in my understanding of architecture, the built environment encapsulates and interacts with the social, the cultural, the historical, and the environmental. Buildings that are unaware of or don't enhance these connections tend to have negative effects on the world we inhabit and are therefore detrimental to our quality of life. They exhaust our resources, natural, physical, psychological, rather than replenish them. Housing stands prominently at the intersection of these interests. If our society achieves positive outcomes for housing, 
we will achieve positive, positive outcomes for people. <coughs> Buildings and architecture take many forms. Often they take the form of a house. Architects' careers can succeed or fail based on their ability to design a successful house. It is often said amongst architects, the house is a laboratory for architectural ideas. But what is a house? A house is a building that houses people, though other buildings can house people too. A house is a building that houses a single person, a couple, a family, an extended family. A house is a shelter, an outlook, and a refuge. <coughs> Depending on your point of view, a house can be a castle or a prison, an opportunity or a risk, <coughs> an anchor or a trap. A house is the location of domesticity. A house is a home. A house is a social investment, a family and a relationship investment, a symbol of stability and security. A house gives us room to breathe, a place to relax and simply be ourselves, or it can slowly suffocate. A house is the location of memory, a focus for nostalgia. A house is the location of familiar loyalty and duty. A house is an aspiration, a fantasy, a holiday hunt, an investment property. A house is a financial investment, an income earner, a tax write-off, a security, a retirement fund, a sure thing or a risk. A house is the subject of a family trust, a house is an asset or a liability, and a house can be a place of business, a place of work, a house is a confined structure or perhaps not, a house is an environmental interface, it ages, it weathers, a house requires caring for, a house is a project, a doer upper, a vehicle for added value, a road to increased wealth, as many reality shows uh, demonstrate. A house is a vehicle for consumerism. A house is a status symbol, a self-portrait. A house defines social position and social success. Houses are intimately connected to our private, family, and public lives. In other words, our house, our home, defines us. The way we are housed is central to our sense of self, our self-image, our cultural background and values. For something so personal, you might expect the house typology to have an enormous range. But the nature of the house and of owning at some stage on selling a house makes many of us conformists. Should providers of buildings have a social conscience? Should buildings be more than the sum of their parts? If we are to have a built environment we can live in comfortably, without stress or fear or physical disadvantage, then yes, buildings should look after us in the way that they are meant to, and we should return the favour and look after them. And build houses that are the best fit for the environmental and social conditions wherever we live. Lenny Tranberg, a Danish architect who will be visiting Christchurch in March next year as part of the annual Fortuna Architecture Lecture Series, states on the homepage of her company website that a building should be generous. It should give more than it takes. It should take part in the life of the city and give something away for free. Coincidentally, I used similar words in a public lecture I gave last month where I said buildings that stand up to detailed scrutiny and give more than they take from the land they stand on deserve to be called architecture whether they are from the hand of an architect or not. This expectation of an appropriate environment is essential when it comes to housing. All buildings combine physical elements to create form and shape exterior and interior spaces in the world. All buildings create relationships, whether intended by the designer, builder, owner, or not. All buildings create effects, whether positive or negative, or more generally combining <coughs> aspects of both. All buildings create ripples in the place where they are placed. Ripples that can have local or regional or national or even global effects of one kind or another. US critic Paul Goldberg has said that architecture matters because it is all around us and what is all around us has to have an effect on us. That effect may be subtle and barely noticeable or it may shake us to the core, but it will never fail to be there. Meaningful architectural and spatial experiences from the library to the shopping mall to the home and everything in between are essential to society's well-being. It would be a tragedy to not expect our cities and the forces and practices that shape them to provide places of substance and meaning of awe and wonder, activity and repose. 
Buildings should contribute to the ways we use and experience our environment, not reduce the possibilities or qualities of our interactions. Too often, delight is the missing ingredient in places that perform poorly, that primarily take from the environment and forget their responsibility to give back, to give something away for free. Shouldn't we feel delighted by the spaces we live in? And short changed when houses provide only one or two of the necessary elements of architecture, when they make us feel frustrated, disappointed, or depressed. <coughs> A house can delight because it fits or suits us well, visually, physically, psychologically, thermally, and financially, because it provides suitable levels of comfort and pleasure. Buildings tell us something about ourselves and the society we live in. Great buildings reinforce our humanity, our sense of self-worth. But even offensive buildings tell us things we should listen to. How else will we ameliorate their worst effects? Because the way a society builds says a lot about what it values or doesn't. We are at a tipping point where climate change and terrorism, surveillance, conservatism, and capital forces are constraining our lives and degrading the built environment. What happens in the big picture affects the way architects and engineers think about making buildings, including housing. For some buildings must change, for some, buildings must change because they consume the greatest amounts of energy. For others, the greening of our cities has the greatest urgency. Our buildings and the way we use them must become more sustainable or go one step further and design them to be ecologically regenerative. To do this entails not only technical solutions, but design solutions. Others will argue for higher economic benefits from our buildings, for buildings to be more efficient. Others wish, wish to embrace new technologies, some of which may improve the qualitative performance of buildings, but not all. Solutions to these issues have the potential to resolve housing needs. I attended a breakfast seminar a few weeks ago held by Beacon Pathway titled Housing Matters. Many professionals and providers are grappling with housing, determined to find appropriate solutions that will not only provide access to more affordable housing, but close the inequality gap. Architects attended, as well as planners, investors, and housing providers, local and central government representatives, landscape architects, and builders. The key words were learn, share, connect, collaborate, innovate. Issues discussed included demographics, market demands, social housing reform, financing and risk management, off-site manufacture, optimizing development location, the building code, placemaking, and neighborhoods. Many different ideas were thrown into the ring, and this is an ongoing series of workshops uh, uh, happening, I think, like <coughs> monthly. For a very few people, for a very few people, affordability is not an issue. They are able to purchase whatever they like, whatever they desire. For others, it is a matter of choice within one's means, or just outside of one's means, as most of us are outwardly mobile and hope to benefit from untaxed capital gain. But when the cost of housing outstrips average income levels, as it seems to be doing in New Zealand, then a greater proportion of the population are unable to afford to own their home. <coughs> Over the past 40 years, the role of housing has changed from the provision of homes, and with that, the structural stability of society, to a concentrated form of capital investment. As a result, participation in home ownership has become less certain and less stable and more difficult to access. The financial structures that go with the property market favor those who already own property and can invest in or are willing to take the risk in owning more, a position that results in speculation and valuation inflation. This appears to have been the case in Auckland for the past year or more, with rapid on selling purely speculative gains. Some say local speculators comprise 45% of the Auckland market, with foreign buyers, a recent whisper post for property inflation, only 8%. But affordability is not just to do with the asking price. It includes the ability to service debt and manage fluctuations in interest rates, local body rates, insurances, the cost of living, the running costs, the maintenance costs over the lifetime of the dwelling, the cost of travel to and from places of work, of school, schooling, retailing, sports and recreation the costs in terms of infrastructure, transport, environmental <coughs> effects, and other social and welfare costs to the country if a good proportion of the population is not satisfactorily housed. And with a New Zealand family home seen as the primary vehicle for capital growth and retirement saving, 
what is the social cost of a generation that's unable to step onto that ladder, let alone climb it? I recently read that in the United States, despite the recession with tax credits and funding hard to access, developers are starting to recognise the value of design. Julie Eisenberg, who I mentioned earlier, also said that many foundations and independent philanthropists who support housing are now looking at sustainability and design as part of their investment evaluation. Enterprise Community Partners, a significant housing funder, has started the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, which works to educate affordable housing developers about the power of design for their communities. Perceptions have changed. There is value in design and lessons shared by the progressive developers and their architects are influencing the institutional structure of housing. This is a, a couple more examples of, of um, Eisenberg and Koenig's uh, housing work. <coughs> uh, I want to show you some recent initiatives by architects who have thought outside the square. Alejandro Arabella is an architect whose bold but simple idea changed the concept of social housing in Chile, a country with many social problems stemming from a low wage economy and the substandard environments the poor have been supplied to live in. Arabella was in Christchurch last year and I was lucky enough to talk with him. Concerning his housing work, he was at pains to point out his office is a for profit office. He does not work pro bono or discount his fees for social housing. If architects are to use their skills and talents and provide ideas to solve these kinds of problems, they need to be as well paid for it as in for any other commission, he said. Quinton Monroy Housing is, is an inner city site in the Quiqueway in northern Chile that for decades had informally housed about 500 people in very high density, shanty type conditions. It was decided that people could stay in that location where they had developed family, community and work-based connections and for the government to build new dwellings for them. But for the rebuild, the available budget was only $7,500 per family, that's US dollars, uh, this was in the 2001, which was perhaps sufficient to build small and cheap or, as Aravena suggested, they could build just half of a better quality house the half with services and seismically structural world walls <coughs> and of an adequate family size and allow residents to complete and extend the dwellings themselves. The standard typologies were rejected, the sort of standardized repetitive blocks, uh, the poor community space and services, and the unregulated and structurally dangerous add-ons uh, that were happening in, in that environment. And the design was developed with community involvement, and <coughs> an Arab Vena's proposal was, was built. The result has transformed the community and gained international attention for Arab Vena, who has designed a number of similar developments in the Americas and Europe. The remarkable thing with Arab Vena's work is that the housing units are designed to be owned upgraded and expanded by the residents so that they can benefit financially from increases in value. After five years, units have increased in value from $7,500 to $25,000. It gets the lowest income people onto the property ladder, improving not only their wealth, but their health, their self-esteem, and their ability to contribute positively to their society. Aravina doesn't challenge the status quo or seek to overhaul property ownership structures. Instead, he finds ways through design and creative thinking to use the existing system to better advantage. They have very minimal dwellings when they're finished. Uh, it was a very tiny budget they had to work with. Uh, but the residents over time uh, transform uh, the apartments into quite miraculous uh, other kinds of dwellings. <coughs> Ian Ashfield provided, proposed a similar housing development for an inner city slum site in Manila back in 1976. Even now, his proposal would be seen as innovative and socially experimental. His design would have empowered residents to help build their homes themselves, using local materials and methods, 
in a village camp that encouraged diversity and community interaction, mixing public use buildings with private dwellings. <coughs> Green technologies were also included, wind turbine pumps, <coughs> solar panels, and self-composting toilets. In the mid-70s, it was pretty daring to suggest alternative technologies for mainstream use. Despite winning the competition, Athfield's project did not get built. Instead, the Philippines have had decades of environmentally inappropriate cookie-cutter type development that is not uncommon anywhere in the world, including New Zealand. It was a typology that Aravena rejected as inefficient and lacking humanity. Michael Moltzan is a Californian architect renowned for his art galleries and sculptural private homes on the hills above Los Angeles. But he also designs and builds apartment developments in the Skid Row district for the formerly homeless. <clears throat> the Skid Row Housing Trust believes in the power of good design to <coughs> transform lives. Founded 30 years ago, they started by employing architects to transform old residential hotels in the area, turning them into low-income apartments, and then as momentum built in a greater awareness of the recognition and recognition of the added value that architects were bringing to these projects, they commissioned new apartment buildings, of which Meltzer has so far built three, with his fourth just starting on site, and a fifth on the drawing boards. <coughs> these developments create new possibilities for the city at large, as well as <coughs> for the vulnerable and traditionally poorly served residents. They raise the standard for public housing, and standard of urban design for the city. They create optimism for the residents and better awareness and understanding amongst other citizens. Carver Apartments, which is this building on the screen, <coughs> responds dramatically to its adjacent freeway location, making the most of a marginal site while creating a refuge with an inner city courtyard which serves as a community hub. Its form and position act like a beacon to passing motorists, heightening the awareness of the development. Like Aravena, Maltzen has paid the standard architectural fee, which enables his office to take the time and care required to provide quality architecture, but at an affordable build cost. Every element in a building has to do three things, he says, not just one. The fins that are a design feature in the Carver building courtyard are also structural columns and drainage pipes. They cannot be value managed out. All of the Trust's developments include communal spaces, <coughs> kitchens, dining areas, gathering spaces, plazas and gardens, as well as medical and social support services <coughs> on the ground floors. The LA Times in a recent article said the distinction between basic shelter and a supported home is being eloquently made. These buildings represent the architecture of ambition <coughs> to do better despite the odds. The message to the neighbourhood is you deserve more than a budget-driven box. You deserve hope. One Santa Fe, uh, which is this building here, is <coughs> built on a similar marginal site alongside railway lines, but again responds positively to the design informed by transport and railway forms. It has been designed like a piece of infrastructure connecting pedestrians to street level and taking them up and through public parts of the building with the overbridges across the tracks and connect with rail and bus services. It is a more varied development than um, the previous one, with different apartment types aimed at a range of demographics, including some student and middle income housing. In Star Apartments, which has recently been completed, the units have been placed above an existing two story building that could have been demolished, but for sustainable reasons wasn't, with a generous shaded plaza between an outdoor room with views down along the surrounding streets. The Republic Health provides on the ground floor, community and wellness centres on the second, and four levels of housing above the plaza. <coughs> Each unit was prefabricated and trucked to site and lifted onto the new raised structural floor plate. Meltzown also believes that to replace homelessness with a home and poverty with dignity, a high standard of architecture <coughs> must be achieved. The same as for any public building in the city. Why should vulnerable people deserve any less? Frank Lloyd Wright, famous for his extravagant houses such as Falling Water, similarly believed that everyone had the right to live in dwellings with high design standards. On several occasions through his career, but most notably in the 1920s with his American Systems Built House design, 
in which the commercial volume builders provide affordable house designs based on variations of standard parts, rather than the more common repetition of complete houses, like the pre-cut California bungalow, many of which were shipped out to New Zealand and Australia and still stand in some of our older suburbs. Developments Wright was involved in had a much higher variety of types, from cottages to semi-detached, standalones and apartments, all based <coughs> on standard methods of construction and related building details. The same but different approach encouraged higher levels of individual identity and pride of the residents within the community. The Sugar Hill District in, in Harlem in Manhattan embodies the same negative connotations as Skid Row does in LA. But architecture is changing this environment too and the people's lives that go with it. Broadway housing communities, a not-for-profit housing provider, employed David Ajaye, one of the UK's highest profile contemporary architects, to design a large housing block for homeless and low-income families. Ajaye's building doesn't try to be beautiful. It is an assertive presence in the neighbourhood, drawing on local typologies while reworking the details. It is built of quality materials that will endure and ensure lower maintenance costs, <coughs> another form of affordability. And as it is for families, the mixed use development includes a preschool facility and a children's museum of art and storytelling. For a development pitched well below the median affordable income, pitched to people substantially in need, Sugar Hill is an inspiring agent of change for this particular community. The images I've just scrolled through are from an American online magazine called Mark, uh, which is where we can look at it at the time. Partially funded by a government grant, the Wellington City Council, which is one of New Zealand's larger owners of social housing, has been employing leading architects and engineers to re-strengthen and upgrade the city's post-war housing estates to current living standards, as well as building new. One new development, the Regent Park Flats, located in the <coughs> central centre of Newtown on Owen Street, a middle to low income area with a high proportion of rental properties, places two and three storey townhouses and apartments around a central landscape and circulation area. Designed by Stables and Team Architects, the project sets a high standard with a limited palette of forms and materials heightened by splashes of bright colour. The complex integrates with the neighbouring community, yet is clearly different, but in a positive way. Affordable housing should not be sprinkled through residential suburbs in an apologetic manner. How do residents gain dignity thinking they're the odd ones out? But assertively, so the development adds value to the local environment. New Town Flats by Studio Pacific Architecture and Dunning Forms and Engineers is an upgraded and refurbished 1960s housing estate with townhouses at the base and an apartment tower with communal plaza and gardens. These buildings were well designed at the time by government architects, many of them talented European immigrants, <coughs> so the building's design bones are good and respond well to refurbishment. An innovation that creates both privacy and interaction with the adjoining street is the application of perforated screens along a generous walkway. This one design element repurposes what was once a windy access way and turns it into a shared meeting space that is semi-private with safe outlook to the street. A similar project again, the Central Park Flats in Brooklyn by Novak and Middleton with Dunning Thornton engineers again. Simon Novak said at a talk last year that he found it a more fulfilling project than any of the private residential work he has done, as he could clearly see the difference his architecture made improving the lives of many, not just a few. Not just a few. There are at least three other city council housing estates that have been given a new lease of life over the last five years. When it was built in 1978, Rome Village Flats in Sydenham had similar social ideals and was of a similar quality for the standards of the time for the projects I have been describing. Painted white when first built, it was a crisp and varied group of dwellings aimed at low-income families and vulnerable single people. Based on Scandinavian models, Don Cowley's architecture and landscaping supported the community well. To demolish Brian Village is another loss for Christchurch, is <coughs> Christchurch.
Christchurch's urban fabric and architectural history. And another indication this country has little interest in sustainability as an across the board issue. Little interest in integrated architecture or maintaining and regenerating its building stock. The government's stance <coughs> appears less than constructive. It could be said to be exploitative. Is it not a corrupt way of thinking to each year extract millions of dollars from Housing New Zealand's revenue and so-called dividends in order to keep the department efficient, as Finance Minister Bill English said on Radio New Zealand morning report just yesterday, and to bolster the surplus rather than reinvesting in adequate maintenance, refurbishment and new development? What is efficient about neglecting buildings and neglecting people? What is efficient about not looking after <coughs> your own tenants? Isn't investment in the future, which projects like Quinta Monroy, Skid Row, Sugar Hill, Regent <coughs> Park and so forth the display, a more sustainable and therefore more affordable strategy? <coughs> Finally, I want to show you some, <coughs> some different types of urban infill houses, some small scale interventions uh, that add to the texture <coughs> of a city. Uh, this is Vo Trong Nia in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. He, uh, one of his projects was the, this, what he called House for Trees, um, where he has sprinkled um, separate uh, architectural elements into a, a, a very small urban site uh, to create a, a house made out of each of these elements, and then planted a, a tree atop each, each of the boxes. Um, so the, he, he claims that there have been no trees in the urban area in um, Ho Chi Minh City. They've all been eradicated uh, in the development of the city. Uh, and his ambition is to, with every single one of his projects, uh, convince his clients to plant a tree as part of the, uh, part of the completion of the project. He's also designed an affordable infill house. <coughs> uh, very simple spaces uh, using local materials and, and local technologies. In a way, it's very similar to, to the next project I'm about to show you, uh, which is uh, with Kevin Daly, uh, who, like Eisenberg and Mount Sand, has designed a number of low-income housing developments in LA. Uh, but here, he's worked with architecture students from UCLA and designed this backyard bio home. It's a response to LA's housing crisis, the worst they say in 70 years. <coughs> uh, and. Uh, the students identified backyards in LA's suburbs with an ability to house a great number of people in a small scale, temporary manner. There are half a million houses in LA with back gardens that could easily accommodate an auxiliary dwelling, daily claims. The bio home is a 35 square meter bed sit with bathroom and a simple tent like construction, easy to erect and dismantle using sustainable and reusable materials with design features to ensure it's not just a shed but a structure with character and easy to integrate alongside existing homes. Daly says it's conceived as a temporary structure that you would rent or buy like a car and then trade in rather than paying off a 30 year mortgage on a house. New Zealand architect Chris Moller has developed a housing product called Clip Row. On his website, Chris says the time is right for radical low impact habitation, a super inexpensive accessible live work devices that are in tune with our fragile planet. Clip Raft is a radical building system that provides answers to the tough questions of how to achieve inexpensive, sustainable, autonomous habitation for the 21st century, he claims. The system utilizes CNC machine plywood. CNC is a computer-driven cutting tool. To form a lattice of very strong laminated timber elements assembled from standard panels quickly clipped into floor, wall, and roof elements, which Chris calls rafts. Open flexible spaces complemented with plug-in bath pods, kitchen pods, bed pods, or storage pods as required. Rapid prototyping and fabrication within factory conditions, and flat pack transport and rapid assembly on site ensure affordable results. This flexible system allows for customized building solutions similar to Frank Lloyd Wright's American Systems Built Homes where the same details are put together in different ways. Uh, finally, 
um, Zhang Ke and his office standard architecture in Beijing have been responsible for very small scale insertions in Hutong districts of Beijing. Hutongs are traditional settlements within the city with small courtyard houses fronting narrow streets and alleys. Many Hutong districts have been demolished, making way for new developments, though a few are now heritage protected. Zhang Ke's proposals comprise small scale insertions into the Hutong fabric, single community rooms, extensions to buildings, spaces grouped around the tree. These tiny structures are like habitable street furniture which contrast with the traditional materials but have a design logic that supports residents by adding to the social environment. By being different, they act as landmarks or beacons within the maze of the Hutong district. They serve these intricate urban spaces but are not subservient. In conclusion, architects are trained to think laterally. Architecture has a very real role to play in the provision of low cost and affordable housing. This needn't require architects to subsidize their fee. This needn't mean their designs will be more expensive. Stereotypes must be overcome at all levels. All of the architects I've shown today, perhaps with the exception of David and Jay, <coughs> are what you could call ordinary architects, not stars or academics or young and emerging. They are experienced architects running busy offices doing work that includes affordable housing. We need talented and experienced architects to deliver quality housing at all levels of society that is appropriate, affordable, and appreciated. Thank you. <coughs>
He's actually involved in the design of the Redcliffe Kindergarten um, building, where, where aspects of that building will use the Kukrak system, but I'm not sure if the external envelope would use it. Yes? From an architect's perspective, what are the biggest barriers, big regulatory barriers, to solving some of these problems with that one? And also, if an architect knows there's private capital out there,